or if we, uh, uh, we call it the sponsored by Berkeley and uh, zip bolt lighters and what have you, different sponsors. And uh, been a professional guy on the water, the little river, and uh, just forest land everywhere, mountains and all that sort of business, you know. And uh, as I turned around and started heading back, I had a big rock uh, splash in front of me. Then I had another one and another one. I looked up and there was another one coming towards me, kind of catapult across the sky. And I looked where it came from and there was uh, these three uh, massive silhouettes just inside a tree line. And it was a beautiful July day, just a beautiful day, not, not a cloud in the sky, about one o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, I remember the trees kind of, you know how the trees kind of sway back and forth and you see glimpses and stuff, and, you know, like, in, you know, from the, from the sunlight. <laughs> anyway, this, this one uh, big silhouette <laughs> walked out of the woods and uh, walked into the water and I was about 30 feet from him. And uh, I thought, uh, when I first seen him, I thought, my God, <laughs> what, what, what is that, you know? And you know, I didn't believe in Bigfoot, okay? I was one of these guys, I hunted and fished all my life. Never seen anything unusual, I hunted bear, hunted wild boar, deer, all, all sorts in different states. <clears throat> I'm the type of guy, if I seen, if something come on about Bigfoot on TV, I, I turn the channel, you know? I didn't give it a second thought. And uh, anyway, this being walked out, and I was, there I was. I mean, I was looking at this fella, you know? And, uh, and I thought, my God, that must be a Bigfoot. <laughs> you know, because he's about, I'd say about eight, nine foot tall, you know, weighing through for seven, eight hundred pounds probably. Mm -hmm. And uh, massively constructed, powerfully constructed. I was a former bodybuilder, competitive bodybuilder, so I, I knew about how muscles look like, you know, the tie-ins, the traps, the pectoral muscles, deltoids, and all that sort of business. And uh, very reddish, dark reddish hair, hair all over his body. Uh, and, I, and the way the sun was, I could, you know, when he, like, breathe or move or anything, you can see the muscles flex a little bit, you know. And uh, so I thought, my God, you know. So I went ahead and took my stringer and I kind of, I tossed it to him. And uh, I don't know how long I was looking at him, he was looking at me, but I felt really ins insignificant, you know. I mean, this was a creature that are being, I call them beings that were just so, just so huge and uh, so human-like. But anyway, uh, I got the, uh, I got kind of, I got kind of scared. And, uh, and I was used to being around, you know, dang, dangerous things, you know, because that's what I did for a living, you know. I was, uh, I was a protection specialist. I, I was a bodyguard, okay. I was also worked for security, uh, had contracts with Raytheon, Department of Defense, you know. So I was used to being around, you know, people and things that, that could kill you, okay. But anyway, uh, I got kind of a, I got kind of a fear in me, and I uh, started walking away and uh, kind of you know, backwards. And that's not very easy to do. I was tripping and falling and what have you. So uh, then I kind of panicked and I ran into the woods. Like I said, there wasn't any, uh, you know, there wasn't no trails in the woods. And uh, so the only thing I could think of was, man, I had, you know, I got to get out of here, you know. And I was running through the woods and of course I was getting hit by everything, branches and Thorn, thorn bushes and just everything. And uh, made it back to my camp. And I was even afraid of the, the 
truck wouldn't start, even though I had no trouble with my truck. But I was like, you know, my God, I suppose my truck don't start. <laughs> so I went ahead and I, and I uh, as I was going past my baby tent, I grabbed it through the tent, through my ride rail tent, left a lot of things there. I got my truck started up and I just was beating it up the, that, that rough road. I got to uh, I got to where Maria, Kentucky was, and uh, I pulled in there to get some gas, and uh, people were staring at me, and uh, and I wonder you know what they staring at, you know. So I looked down at me, and I, my whole body was covered. I was cut up from going through the you know the briars and the bushes and the trees. But, shirt was tore up, I was bleeding here and there. And uh, I got back and I, I told my buddies about it. And they said, my God, man, you must have seen a Bigfoot. <laughs> Just so I started uh, looking it up, you know, I started uh, looking it up, you know. And uh, then I started getting in touch with uh, some of the, uh, I don't know, so-called experts at the time, you know. And uh, they were telling me, well, John, you must have seen a, a tree stump, or you must have seen a, uh, you know, a giant naked hairy hippie or something like that, you know what I'm saying? And uh, so I thought, well, these people aren't any help at all. And the thing is, what I, I didn't realize that there was a big controversy whether a Bigfoot was a, a great ape or whether it was a human. Okay, I didn't know anything about that because I didn't know anything about the human, you know, the, the you know, you know, the, the, the Bigfoot world. Okay, I didn't know anything about the controversy, you know. And it was clear to me that because I didn't see a, you know, a big giant silverback gorilla, that I didn't see a Bigfoot. See. So anyway, that led me into uh, forming my own group called the Don Pete Wilmes Adventure Group uh, team. And uh, then we started studying the Bigfoot later on the dog man. Celeste and I hooked up about seven years ago. Can you tell them about you, huh? <laughs> well, my first sighting I was a child. I think I told some of you. I was with my, my little brother, my father, in a hunting property in the southern tier of New York. So we were, every weekend we were in the wilderness. Um, we were probably about a quarter mile away from the rest of the family, and we were playing by a stream. And it was beautiful sunny, you know, coming through the trees. And the next thing I knew, it got dark. And I looked up to where it got dark, and there was just this giant going back and forth, back and forth in the trees, just watching us. And, I mean, the sun was behind it, so I didn't see the features, but I knew it was hairy, and I knew it was a giant something or other. Um, my brother just ignored it or did not acknowledge it, and then all of a sudden he popped up and said, I don't feel very comfortable here anymore. So we went back, hightailed it, ran as fast as we could, back to my parents. I don't know if I was like frozen in place, but my big sister instinct was to protect my brother. So I just kind of watched the thing to see if it would make a move towards us and whatnot. But years later, my father didn't tell me this story until after I started researching Bigfoot and I told my parents what I was doing is that at that same property, he was there with my uncle fixing the roof, and he saw, I mean, he describes it, a woman come out of the woods who was wearing a fur coat. Yes. <laughs> it was actually a female Sasquatch, or Bigfoot, had come out of the woods, and she was eating berry off my dad's property, it was at the tree line, and he had her in the scope, which was on his gun, and he was watching her, he was just watching her. But out of the corner of his eye, he could see something really large shimmying down the tree really fast. And so he looked and a big male came out and got her and brought her back into the woods because he had spotted my dad looking at her through a scope, which was on a gun. So even though my father was just watching, they took it as a threat. And the other part to the story is that they never left that property alone. We'd come up there after the winter if you know anything, I mean, Michigan, obviously, you know, you have bad winters. In New York, in this part, you have bad winters also. But we would come up to this property after a bad winter, and the door would be torn off and thrown across the field. 
you know, something had been in it. was a, one of those silver, you know, those silver trailers. That's what it was. And it would be knocked off the foundation. We had to jack it up every spring after this encounter. And they the dump the outhouse, they took the outhouse over. It was just every year it was a fight. And he just couldn't figure out how this was happening. And he kept saying, damn kids. You know, like, what what? What kids? You know. There's no kids. We're in the middle of the woods in State Line in New York. But we would hike every year. And since we were little kids, little tights, we were always in the woods hiking in these particular woods. And one time, it was a trail we always used. And on, I don't know, it must have been like, I mean, my dad was almost six foot and it was the butt of his gun. And he, on this tree was a set of really large deer antlers. And so my dad was like, oh, that's really cool. And so he reached really high to get the antlers down to give it to my older sister. And I was like, Dad, how did the antlers get all the way up there? And he goes, damn kids. <laughs> so, so to him, anything that happened up there, he didn't want us to know what it was. He just always blamed on the damn kids. So I didn't really you know, pay much attention, but I didn't want to tell my dad what I saw because I was afraid he wouldn't believe me. He didn't want to tell us what he saw because he was afraid we wouldn't believe him. So as I got older and I had children, I lived in the Catskill Mountains. I lived in uh, Tennessee, South Carolina. There's always stories of the Bigfoot. And when I would go out with my sons, because I had sons, so we were very outdoorsy, like land between the lakes and whatnot in Tennessee and in South Carolina and in the Sea Islands, you know, you find different evidence of different things. And in South Carolina, everybody talked about the Lizard Man and whatnot. So I just started investigating local stories of where we were on my own, just me. Once in a while, my sons would go with me. But when I lived in the Casco Mountains, I had lived in a house that was built into the side of the mountain. And I had a blueberry patch um, in the front of the house. And I was literally on the shore of the mountain range. And um, my ex-husband was gone for weeks at a time for work. So I was there alone with my oldest son, and the roof line is in the back of the house is about six inches off the ground, and there's an old wagon trail from way back that ran the back of the house. And I'd be in there at night, or didn't matter, foggy day, snowy day, once in a while you hear a bang on the roof, and the bang on the roof came taller than me. So I go out and this tree branch fell on the roof. No, nope, there's no tree branch, but there was tracks. So I just like, that's Bigfoot. We got Bigfoot. <laughs> you know, it was just like, yep, there's those damn kids. Follow me here. <laughs> so it's just kind of like, you know, with a two year old, it's like, just don't worry about it. You know, what was that? Don't worry about it. So I, that's how I started investigating ever since I was a child, wherever I was. I would just look for anomalies different things that other people would notice in the woods. And then fast forward to when Don and I started researching together, because um, I think he would made a point on a page I was following, and I agreed with your point. I was like, yeah, I can, you know, I agree with that. And then we started talking about Bigfoot, and then my oldest son came to me one night and said that a girl he was talking to hit a Bigfoot on the road, and that there was evidence on her vehicle. And so, I so said, if you can get the evidence, I think I know somebody that can get it, you know, DNA testing on it. It was Don. And that's how we kind of just started researching together. And it's been, <laughs> it's never been a dull moment since. <laughs> so. <laughs> that's a wild times, <laughs> man. I think we have favorite stories. So I'm going to share one of my favorite stories. And this is just typical. Typical of what happens to us when we're out researching is this one particular place. My youngest son had never been out bigfooting with me. He wanted to go. So we took him. And Don got everything set up for us. <clears throat> and we're around the fire pit. And it's, you know, he had just had surgery, so he wasn't feeling too good. But he did this for us. And that night, the first night, we <laughs> heard this crash. And it was just his chair, but something picked his chair up and tossed it. And I was like, okay, so we know they're here, we know they see us. Like me. 
But what, they, what we found out later was I had made cookies. I made peanut butter cookies and chocolate chip cookies, and I had them in a bin. And he was out there by the fire eating them. <laughs> and then he put them away. Well, the next night, he's sitting out by the fire eating them. I go to bed, my son goes to bed, and he hears growling from the woods behind him. He's sitting in the fire. The fire's right there. He's sitting there, and he's eating the cookies, and something's growling from the woods. Wait, wait, wait. Just outside the fire light. <laughs> Yeah. There's at least two big foot, maybe more. Yeah. So he get, he gets up to come in the tent, and I'm trying to help him because, like I said, he just had surgery, so I'm trying to get him in a comfortable spot. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this gigantic thing come out of the woods, grab grab the big the tin of cookies, which is I mean it was a good sized tin of cookies, ran off into the woods like a linebacker holding the football, you know, <laughs> just. One of those cookies. <laughs> One of your cookies. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so he wasn't happy with Don sitting there eating cookies. I told you they were there too, but I walked in the tent. I said, man, big. I mean, you know. He was getting nervous. Yeah, I was getting a little nervous. And I uh, said, you know, I'm like, the big foot are just, just inside the woods there. And I no sooner said that, man, here they come. You come right through there and grab my, grab my cookies, man. I have a question. In your researching that you guys have done, have you ever been run out of the area? Not by big <laughs> Well, we did kind of push. And with Ari? Well, yeah, they threw stones at Ari. Yeah, they were throwing. We didn't leave. We left that trail. Yeah, we left that area, in particular area. Because um, Ari's a big German shepherd who has led me to many uh, uh, structures. And uh, he, he kind of knows because he would. You know, we'd hear it coming through the air, and Ari would back up, and the stone landed right where Ari was standing. So they didn't appreciate that Ari was there. So, so yeah, yeah, they threw limbs at him. But we didn't. We left the trail. We didn't leave the area. But there was one time it's in this same area, actually. Um, well, it was well anyway. It was still in Kentucky. Um, Don was in his tent, I was in mine. And this is where we think it's a nursery because it sounded like babies crying in the woods. And then you heard something bigger come through and Ari got up and he started barking. And I went to get up and Ari literally pushed me back down and stood over me so I was looking at his belly and it was like, don't get up. You know, he would not let me get up. And Don was in his tent, and he heard, he was, I heard whatever he was barking at. And it just kind of like, and it was just before dawn. So, but Ari did not, I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to get up. You know, he just said, no, you're staying down. But he was trying to be a personal protector. So, that's his job, and he was doing his job. And we're pretty confident and comfortable when we take Ari out with us, because we watch how he reacts. And we have left areas when he had an adverse or he's alerted me to something. I'm like, and I've told Don, and there's places we've been where I told Don we need to go. And Don has learned to listen. Yeah. <laughs> it's time to go, you know. So, but as far as leaving the whole area, we didn't just the right. trail. What, what Celeste and I try to do is we try to, to locate uh, Bigfoot habitat areas, okay? Because we know that Bigfoot, <coughs> Bigfoot can show up anywhere. They can show up in somebody's backyard, be in town, be anywhere. You know. So what we what, what we try to do is we we try to find where they actually live at, okay? And when you when you run across an area like that, there won't be any. You will not doubt that you're in the right place because there will be tracks everywhere of all different sizes there will be structures everywhere there'll be all kinds of bigfoot activity you'll hear all kinds of tree knocks you'll buy a house you'll hear uh, uh you'll hear babies you'll hear babies uh crying or what have you because that, that's where they raise their families at you know and so we we have found uh, several of these places uh different states and uh you know, that are great research locations, great, great research areas, you know. So that's, that's mainly what, what we do.
try to find these areas. And we let the evidence, and we let the evidence speak for itself. I mean, we don't go looking for one particular thing, and we're not strictly just all Bigfoot. Um, we, where I live is on the Tennessee River. We've actually got a picture of Dog Man in the backyard. Um, and that's another thing Ari alerted me to is he didn't want to go in the backyard anymore at certain times of the day. It's usually from the afternoon to sunset. He does not want to go in the backyard. And I have just a little fenced in backyard, but then a longer yard that goes out to like a line of woods. And that's where we got a picture of the dog man. So I just saw something in the woods because I'm like, why won't he move out there? And I took a picture and we blew it up and you can see that it's definitely a dog man. And just recently I took a picture of something else and it wasn't as pronounced, but you could see almost like fur in the picture. But, you know, we learned to listen to Ari quite a bit. But, you know, it can be, and that's where the evidence lies. But recently I'm talking to some of you who I learned to listen to her too because we, we was up on this ridge and we actually named that ridge Bigfoot Ridge. Yeah, yeah. And uh, she said, Don, that uh, there was like a tree stump that was down, I don't know, maybe 100 feet. Yeah, it was down pretty far. And uh, maybe more down. And she said, I, I, she goes, man, I swear that that stump moved on, on us. And I, I looked at it and I went, no, oh, no. Looked at it again, looked at it again, and she insisted. She goes, God, I know it. I seen the eyes. I said, I said okay, and I saw it. So I took a picture of it. <laughs> and uh, we come back just a few minutes later because I had seen a big, I had seen a big foot run across the ridge down uh, towards the river. And uh, so we thought, well, we'll go ahead and we'll get in the vehicle, get get in the truck, drive down. Try to head it off, okay. But what it did, we think, is it, it backtracked. So we came back up. <clears throat> well, guess what? That tree stump wasn't there anymore. So that tree stump was actually a big foot, too. See? And uh, when he enlarged the photo, you yeah. could see its face, you could see its brows. Brow and it must have been a young one, a juvenile. That but they'll stand perfectly still. Well, it just ever so slightly turned its head to look at me. You know, just like it was there, hunkered down, it was facing the tree, and it just ever so slightly turned its head, and that's why I saw the, I saw the movement, I was like, right there, you see it? And then he took a picture, because I insisted, Yeah. and it ended up being, right. I <laughs> tree stump's no longer there. I got a friend uh, that's a, a retired uh, police forensic video photograph uh, guy. Did it for court and stuff like that, and for 27 years. And uh, I take a lot of our photographs to him. And uh, he asked, he was wife asked me the other day. He said, he said, man, he said, he goes, where the heck are you people taking these pictures at? And I, you know, I said, well, we're not going to kind of disclose exactly where. But he says, man, he says, uh, these are you know, really incredible pictures, you know. Something that's like a lot of the pictures, you know, uh, they're far away, and then when you, of course, when you enlarge the pictures, it messes the pixels up, you know, and uh, things like that. But, but, uh, but we, we, we've taken pictures of Bigfoot and uh, Dog Man or what have you. Yes, ma'am? I wanted to ask if you've ever been harassed by authorities about your research, about what you're doing? Well, now, we'll tell you what happened. Okay, uh, in this one state park, uh, seems like there's been several couples and a fisherman who have been run off by Bigfoot. Okay, uh, one fellow was fishing there, there on the river, and Bigfoot threw some uh, large branches and things at him, to run him off. He went straight to the to the uh, the game warden. And uh, then uh, you go up high on this one hill, and there's a like uh, where people park at. Park. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there was this couple up there that was parked, and uh, this Bigfoot, you know, come out on, scared the bejesus out of them, you know. Uh, 
to the point where the guy didn't put his clothes on, the park ranger had to go back. <laughs> yeah, he had to es escort him back yeah, to his clothes. Back. <laughs> but the Bigfoot took his shoes. <laughs> yeah, the Bigfoot took his shoes. <laughs> so anyway, this, this kind of stuff went on a few times so far. So you know what they did? The parks department, they went ahead and took the trees that the Bigfoot was using for cover and cut the trees down. And then they told us, well, it was because of an erosion problem. Well, anybody knows if you cut the trees down off a hill, that it will increase erosion, okay? Well, in this particular area, they know Don. They see him coming, and they will literally drive up and shut the road off. Yeah, they've done that to me, too. Yeah, yeah. they will literally cut him off. Now, I can get in there. But once they see him and his white beard, they're like, that's that's the Bigfoot guy. Oh. So, so yeah. and, but it was one of the park rangers that told us. Oh, they'll race up there and actually block the road. Yeah, so we can't get up there. So we can't get up there. Have you ever had like more serious like government people contact you or anything? Well, we were in contact with a government <laughs> official, but we were no longer talk to government officials because he wanted to know where we were working and we were dumb enough to tell him and now all those trees are cut down. And not only that, now let me tell you they something. Leveled, they leveled it. Um, leveled it. So we will no longer disclose where we This, uh, I, knew, I know a lot of people in government, okay? Oh, government. Right. And uh, this fella got in touch with me. He, uh, Washington guy, about maybe third or fourth from the top of the, of the uh, U.S. wildlife. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, he said, "Man, this guy who is, um, you know, kind of like a wheel there in uh, Kentucky and Tennessee that, that works for us. You know, uh, I'm gonna have him contact you all." So he contacted me, and uh, he says, "Man, he says, uh, I want to know, you know, where." Where these some of these habitat areas are at, so we can preserve them and stuff like that. See, so I'm, and he's giving me some ideas and he's telling me some areas to check out. Some of them are panning out, some of them may, you know. And uh, so, but we're noticing that the ones that I that we're reporting back on, we go back a few weeks later and all the structures are destroyed. Uh -huh. And, the, and it's locked. It's been locked. Yeah, all the structures in these different locations are destroyed. So in reality, what they were doing was using us mm -hmm. to to let them know that you know the Bigfoot do live there, and so they can wipe out their you know their yeah. village. You know, we call them tribes of Bigfoot is what we call them. We call them. Uh, our own. We we believe that they're giant uh, uh, indigenous peoples, what we think they are. Yeah, we're indigenous. Yeah. And, uh, but the thing is, though, is that, uh, yeah, we either, like, we refer to them, we, like, we, like, the habitat area, in the union that you get, like, we refer to them as a tribal, tribal area, tribal village. And you would, and if you was at one, you would, realize why we do that because of the, my gosh the, we have got hundreds of pictures of these structures okay in these in these areas these locations you know I've actually had people approach me okay and offer me as much as ten thousand dollars to kill one you know to lead them to kill one okay you know what would happen to you if you did that, right? Well, the thing is, you know, I, would, you I, I would never do that. I would never do that. You know, that's why we have to protect them. We have, we have, we have to protect And we got to protect the dog man, too. And the little people. And the little people. You know, we, I don't even call dog, I don't even call dog man upright canines anymore. Okay? Okay, just the way I am, I call them tri tribal dog man. Okay, because I found out that they have upright hunting blacks. They use long sticks for tools. They actually repair their their shelters. Okay, dog dog men have hands just like we do, 
and I and, and, and I believe too that they that what makes them uh, so I mean for me so surreal is that uh, is the hands you see what I'm saying and it's just uh, we've oh, never had raccoon. yeah we we have never had a dog man I have uh, I've had several dogs in around me. I have never, ever had a dog man attack me. But there's not a day goes by that I'm not messaged on Facebook or somewhere that, hey, Don, did you see this new video? Oh, hey, Don, did you see this podcast? Did you see this, to read this book or whatever about the vicious dog man going roaming the countryside, killing, <laughs> killing people, you know? And, you know, the only thing I can say to that is, number one, I've never had a dog man. She's seen one. Okay, and then they can run away. And that's the only thing I've ever seen them do, is run away. When you go out, do you carry a weapon? I always carry a weapon. Okay. You know, I sleep with weapons. <laughs> I, I don't carry a weapon, he's my weapon. Okay. No. I, I have a taser. <laughs> but, but, but the thing is, the thing is, is this, man, is that you know, the way I look at it is if the dog man was this vicious, malicious, flesh-eating, man-hunting, man-killing killer, okay? Look at all the hundreds or thousands of witnesses that have seen the dog man and lived. Right. You know what I'm saying? I don't think they're vicious beings. At all. Um, I think they're just existing like any other creatures trying to exist in this world. And there's little ones, too. And we think that there's probably, you know, that they have little ones. Yeah. Stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you mentioned earlier, as you are speaking about the dog men, how they look, or not the dog men, but the, the Sasquatch, how they look human. What way do they look human? Okay. The, all right. That's a good question. I had a really good look at a Bigfoot. Okay. I was, I, I've seen them after that, but not as good. Okay. Now, when I was about maybe 30 feet from this big foot. Now, the other two stayed within the tree line, okay? But I, it was broad daylight, perfect view, okay? Very dark, reflective face. The nose was not very large. Uh, looked like a, like maybe a, a, a dark, reflected Indian. Native American, you see what I'm saying? And the, the hair all the way up, the cheeks to about here, a little bit further than mine. <laughs> and uh, of course, hair all over its body. Uh, I, I would say six to eight inches of hair. All right, very, you know. Uh, the one I got really close to look at was very dark reddish hair, uh, but very, powerfully constructed you know i mean you could actually see the musculature you know the muscle tie-ins you know the skeletal tie-in the muscular tie-ins uh, of this guy you know and it was a male <laughs> you could tell did it smell you know what you know sometimes you can smell them and sometimes you can't you know i mean i, I have been areas where where man you could just you smell, you know what I'm saying? It's like being near a garbage dump. And I've been in areas that, that you can't. You know, the thing is, it says, uh, the deer smell, they have a very good sense of smell, but the Bigfoot had no problem uh, hunting deer. And that's something else, you know. One, one thing that I have to say, that I have to say is this. One of the first things that, that 22 years ago, when I first started doing the Bigfoot thing, okay, I found out that the Bigfoot hunted deer, okay? But it actually, I did you know, a lot of books, I got 38, 39 books on Bigfoot. A lot of these books were like, well, they eat, you know, insect larvae, crawfish, berries, nuts, and fruit, and you know, this type of thing, you know? But I was finding out, we were finding out that, man, these, these beings hunt. They eat meat too, you know, sort of like, sort of like a bear, you know, on the board. And, uh, and then when I first said that, 
on the World Wide Web. It was like heresy. What are you talking about? My God, there's no way these things, you know, stuff like that, you know. And lo and behold, every time you turn on a Bigfoot show now for the past 10 years, oh, well, the Bigfoot's got a lot of food to eat because there's a lot of there's a big deer herd out here. And I'm like, no kidding. No kidding, you know. And I'm like, you know, we found that out years ago. You know, I get very aggravated with Bigfoot TV, by the way. Yeah, okay. But I mean, it's just, I mean, the nonsense, the ridiculous nonsense, you know. And, um, well, and, you know, and I, another thing that Celeste and I are very careful about, you know, we could take all kinds of pictures of structures, all kinds of pictures. But a lot of pictures we don't take, and the reason why is because we don't find any other Bigfoot evidence, okay? If we don't find Bigfoot tracks, if we don't, if, if we, if there's, you know, some type of other evidence, then we don't take a picture of it. We just move on. Okay. Well, actually, our first time researching together, we discovered that they do deer drives. Oh, they yeah. They do what? Deer drives. Deer drives. Oh. <laughs> we heard this horrible racket. It was like a horrible movie. It was screaming and howling, and it was like something was being, it was literally, I just told them, I was like, I'm bored listening to a horror movie, because they were going, ah, and the coyotes were screaming. And it was just all this ruckus. First time we've been together, dear, uh, uh, Bigfoot hunting. Yeah, it was our very first time. Did not disappoint. And so the next day we were out walking in the woods trying to go in the general direction where we heard all this happening. And it was frozen ground. I mean, we don't, it's never a good weather when we go out big <laughs> It was below freezing, frozen. And we saw all these deer tracks running in one direction. <coughs> well, parallel to the deer tracks were Bigfoot tracks. All running in the same direction, and you tell you, you tell when deer have been running. I don't know if you ever hunted or whatnot, but you, I've been on deer drives with my dad, and you can tell and see the evidence of them running instead of, as opposed to just walking. So yeah, that was our very first time, and so that must have been what was happening that night. It was either they did the deer drive and they were fighting with the coyotes or whatnot, and we never heard the coyotes again. Right. I mean. It was literally something like a horror movie. What, what coyotes will do is they will shadow the Bigfoot, okay? Because uh, they're scavengers, okay? But at the same time, uh, they harass the Bigfoot's hunt, and the Bigfoot hate that, okay? I've actually found coyotes that were smashed against trees, thrown up in trees, all kinds of things, you know, where they just absolutely, they absolutely, you know, they they don't like the coyote there when they're hunting deer. They just don't. And uh, uh, the we the found is awesome, awesome. I mean, my gosh, that deer drive was something else. Yeah. I mean, and you could just tell that the Bigfoot had gotten a hold of the coyote. I mean, you felt sorry for the coyote. You know what I'm saying? Coyote could have left him alone. Yeah. Are you okay if we ask questions? Yeah. So as you mentioned, you mentioned earlier about uh, Bigfoot having his hair on a bumper and was sent for DNA testing. Did you do that? No, we never, this, I was telling about okay. that girl, we ne her uncle took it. So he, I guess uh, once my son told her that I had someone, the uncle took it, and, you know, I've actually taken hair samples and had DNA testing, okay? A lot of times Bigfoot will leave hair like in tree bark, like when they build a structure. Uh, one time found uh, Bigfoot hair seven foot above the ground on a tree line, okay? I don't bother with DNA testing anymore, okay? And I'll tell you why, because when it comes back, they say it's, it has been uh, contaminated. Well, we know that it has not been contaminated. But see, they want one answer. They want one answer. They want it to be some type of chimpanzee or a gorilla or something. You know, if it if it has anything to do with 
a human being that has to be contaminated. So I don't even bother with it. Okay? But tell me what, the, what it came back on that sample you sent. Oh, yeah. What did it come back as? Yeah, 90% mitochondrial uh, DNA. Human. Human DNA. And 10% uh, whatever. Okay. So. The 10% was unidentified. 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 Yeah. And the rest of it was identified as human DNA. Human. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Not contaminated. And I haven't sent anything away in 10, 10 11 years. I guess. So, what, what do you think about them uh, migrating? Do you believe they migrate? Um, I <laughs> you want to answer that? I believe that they <coughs> do migrate. Uh, but. This past week has kind of made me rethink that because this particular area we were in, where we heard the babies crying, I also heard the, um, the vocalization of what I call the old man. And he was there that winter, and this is now summer, and that winter, last winter when we were there, he was vocalizing all the time. So I don't know if they migrate as a whole or if certain particular ones migrate and then come back for mating and raising their young in safe areas. You think they come back to the their same area? I, I think so. But that male stayed. So he had been there throughout the year. But like I said, I call him the old man, so he may not leave. He, I mean, he's the one that does the sing song. Tracks like that. Huge tracks. And it's just <laughs> like, we would pictures like his toe was like the size of the tip of my foot. You know, and he he's the guardian of that particular area. But this past week, I, I've been rethinking that maybe he's passing that torch to, to a younger one because he only vocalized once where the other one had been doing most of the vocalization. Yeah. Um, <coughs> which I kind of miss it because he would do that sing song. And it was so pleasant to listen to. I mean, yeah. and they they hide it. This is kind of in an area where you can hear air traffic. So they would hide it among when the planes would go over. And then it would either be just before the plane went or over just after. or just after. They would you could still pick up the vocalization. So I think part of them are migratory. They're migratory for a reason, whether it be hunting food or to give birth to their babies. They want to make sure they do it in a safe place. In this particular place, there's no hunting allowed. And the trails that are there you cannot go off the trails. Obviously, we do that. With the new technology today, have you ever thought of using a drone? In this area, you can't. This a tree canopy is too thick. How, how I'm much, not talented enough <laughs> to use a drone. How much success have other people had using these things? You know what I'm saying? But the thing is, is they don't talk about the, uh, the migration. I believe that there's two reasons why Bigfoot uh, Village or Clan or whatever would, 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 would migrate. One is a seasonal thing, okay? So that's just familiar with. River, summertime, plenty of cover. You know, a lot of body, you know, they don't, there's no way around. Care come the floods, okay? And they would go up into the hills or we're currently investigating. Mm -hmm. But we believe now that they're there for good. Because you know they've you know, been so much construction and stuff down below. So we think that the ones that were migrating up, and I, I'll tell you something, you know, another area is Green River there in Kentucky, about 700 miles. We, I call it the Bigfoot Highway, okay? Because that area there uh, may have more Bigfoot along that 700 miles per square mile of any area that, that, that I've been to, you know. And uh, now there's a lot of caves in that area. There's, of course, some, some people say they don't ever go in caves. I don't know why they would never do that. But uh, most of these caves are, it's everybody's sort heard of man of cave, but most of my, my caves are on private property, you know. A lot of caves are right along the Green River. You can actually see them right along the Green River. It's not by ledges, cliffs, things like that. But uh, but there are areas where they'll, they're mainly seasonal, but of course they'll, they, they, 
they will move permanently if you know construction work things like that i'll give you another thing here in a minute but who else got a question so you mentioned that you were in south carolina at one point and you mentioned the lizard tent have you ever seen evidence or had an encounter with the lizard tent i went looking for him <laughs> i did not i did find a unusual track to see you also have alligators in that area and every morning i literally had to check under my car for an alligator that's how prevalent they are so my thinking i did see an unusual track but i cannot definitively say lizard man but if you ask anybody in that area of south carolina they're going to swear to you lizard man he says he did not show himself to me um, there was a couple instances of because uh, there's this particular island, and I can give this away, it's Hunting Island, South Carolina. If you ever get to South Carolina, you go to Hunting Island, okay? There's no hotels on it. It's primitive. Nothing's on it. There is something there. Something uh, made structures, and the forest rangers would come and tear them down with four-wheelers. So there is something living on Hunting Island. I have not seen it. I've not seen tracks on Hunting Island, but something is building structures and they are tearing it down. Whether it be Lizard Man or Bigfoot, I feel sorry if it's a Bigfoot because it's hot, it's sticky, and with all that hair. Which could be an adaptation that they call it Lizard Man, but it's actually a Bigfoot. I, I don't know. But whenever I go to South Carolina, I do look and I have not seen it. But I did find a very strange track that kind of had a web, a web between the the toes. But again, I can't definitively say because there's so many gators. So, but the reason why I think it may be a Bigfoot that just kind of like is not as hairy as the others is because in certain Indian folklore, they tell stories of Bigfoot that caked themselves with mud so that the arrows bounced off. So, it could be a Bigfoot that just, you know, some type of adaptation it made to its surroundings. I don't know. But another island where they say it was was Pickney Island. Um, there's a bunch of little sea islands in the southern end of South Carolina. So if you ever want to explore, that would be the place to go. Hunting Island, which is a state park, and Pickney Island, which is near Hilton. So if you, I'd like to know if you find them if you ever go. <laughs> I just wanted to mention, I've always been really fascinated with gorillas. I think that's why I'm so fascinated with this Bigfoot. Is it a part of a primate family or what? But I mentioned at uh, one of the conferences I've been to, either to Cliff or Matt from Finding Bigfoot, that I think it would be so awesome. So many podcasters have so many wonderful call comments where they have actually reported the sounds and the cries and the screams. I think it'd be so awesome if somebody, researchers, would go to a zoo, to a primate in, you know, habitat, and play some of those sounds and see if there's any reaction from that. And yes, and that's why I'm determined to get more vocalization than I've gotten. And if, this is kind of a weird story, but the other night, to kind of, I didn't use vocalizations, but what I used was a song from the 70s from a group called Pink Floyd, and it's called Several Species of Small Furry Animals Gathered Together in a Cage Group with a Pig. <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> and it's uh, several sounds of animals that they use to create this song. And dogs, different animals, and whatnot to create. It's not even really a song, it's just a bunch of noise. And at the end, it's a very old dialect of Welsh speaking at the end of it. Now, years and years ago, I owned a business next, next to a pet shop, and the pets were so loud, the birds and everything was just so loud in the store. So I brought in the CD, and I told me I was friends with the owner, I said, put it on track six. And so he played that, and all the animals, he said, shut up and move to the back of their cages. And were scared to death. <laughs> so, I tried to elicit a response, and we did 
did get vocalization to that, but I kept trying to hit record, and I was just too slow. But yeah, so we use alternative means. We don't howl, we don't knock. I use Pink Floyd. <laughs> Oh, you know, you know, well, you try. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She said she'll say something like, hey, try it. <laughs> you know, well, well. But, uh, yeah, I just, uh, uh, I don't know, that, that's, basically, that, that's basically what we do. You know, we, we go out there and, uh, uh, like, say, like, it's a promising area. And, like, what, we, what, what I do is, is, uh, we know what type of location we're looking for, what type of habitat they like. Now we we'll, may go somewhere and not find anything, and that happens, you know, you're not going to find it. It's like you're fishing, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, like one, one thing I've learned, you know, being an angler is that, you know, 90% of the fish are 10% of the water, okay? That's just the way it is. You know, if, you, if you're looking for fish to catch, you got to be where they're at. You can't wish them there. Okay, same with a big buck or whatever you're hunting or whatever. You can't wish them there. They just ain't going to show up there because you want them to be there. Okay? Same thing with Bigfoot. Bigfoot could show up anywhere. Dog man could show up anywhere. Okay? This person might get lucky fishing the same place on a river for years. And you know, I, I know we've all run into somebody. I, Couple, there's a couple of guys on the Ohio River, and I asked them, I said, well, you fish here? I said, well, you know, 30 years ago, I caught a, you know, 40-pound flathead here. You know, 30 years ago. You know, why not go where they're at all the time? You know what I'm saying? But, you know, uh, so what I do is, what we do is that uh, we know the type of location that the Bigfoot, dog man, little people, what have you, would like. Now, whether they're there or not, we don't know until we investigate. But we use topo maps. We use history. We love history, don't we? We go back into history. You know, Native American settlers, uh, newspaper accounts, whatever, you know. And then we'll go into an area. If more times than not, we won't find anything. Sometimes we do. And that's basically what, how, how, how we do our research. One thing that I have found out is, uh, especially with areas that are known for, say, like the dog man especially, okay, I have never, ever, okay, found a dog man that is, that has been, you know, pushed by publicity, and commercialism. Every time I've gone into an area like that, I've been just absolutely disappointed. A lot of times, a lot of times it happens with Bigfoot too. Okay, the dog man especially. You know, I've never ever found any evidence of dog man in the in, in some of these much publicized, heralded, you know, man eating dog man locations that you hear about so much about. You know. So, I mean, it's just, uh, uh... Our experience with the dog men is that they're shy. They're very shy. Like little puppies. I mean, I feel sorry for them almost, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Hey, Don, have you ever found a, a killing zones where yeah. you'll find, like, oh, maybe five, six, seven skulls and piles of ribs and things like this? I mean, I, I found, like, the rocks and stuff on five trees, and I found the stack rocks. And right. Like, I'll tell you the experience I've had, but I've not found those particular killing areas. Here in Michigan, there's an area where they found like two bear skulls. I mean, it's pretty rare to find skulls and stuff bones anyway up with, but, but they were with, with, within a couple hundred feet of each other in this area. So we don't know if it's like a, a big mountain lion taking them. There's all the Sasquatches right in that area. So we don't know if the Sasquatches killed those bear, or they killed each other, but you know. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah. Kill, kill zones are incredible and they're kind of scary when you find them. Yeah. They're in funnel areas. They'll funnel the game. Okay? And if you look, what they'll, you know, there's always prevailing weather. You know what I'm saying? 90% of the time, maybe the weather coming from the east, 
like coming from the south, depends on what geographic area you're in. Okay, not all the time, but 90% of the time. No front will come in, you know. 90% of the time, the Bigfoot or the dog man, okay, is on the downwind side of the funnel area that kills off. Every time. I've never found that to be wrong. Ever. Okay? And that's what I always look for. If I'm, say like for instance, if I'm in an area where there's most, most of the weather comes in from the east, northeast, and I find a funnel area, okay, then what I'll do is I'll look on the downwind side, okay? There'll usually be a blind of some kind set up, and what they'll also do is they'll have rocks piled up. Oh, they'll have rocks piled up to use to throw. That's what we think they're for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there'll be a pile of rocks. What else would they use it for? Yeah. Maybe to stun the prey for... Or yeah. kill the prey, stun the prey. Yeah. Yeah. Always found that, so... Yeah. But it's always something that you can learn and uh, what have you. And we learn it on our own, basically. Because like I said, most of the things that I see... And, you know, as, as we've expressed, we kind of let the evidence speak for itself because if there's not evidence in the area, you know, it's not a big foot area. Yeah. But, hey, we other, <laughs> but other evidence, like we'll be researching big foot. We're, this is our goal. You know, we've had goals each year to accomplish certain things, and we've accomplished them. But in trying to match those goals, we have found other things, like the little people. You know, why are we seeing these little tracks? And <laughs> we want to look at more. And, you know, I followed the little tracks, and they disappeared into nothing. And I don't know if they backtracked on me or what. Um, but but the other thing about Bigfoot tracks, and we test this out, and we've done it in a couple of our videos, is we went to this place we'd never been to before. And we found a really nice bow tree um, and, a, you know, a couple of other things that were twisted bow tree. On our way back out, that's when we found the Bigfoot track. And it followed us in and was behind us. We never saw it, smelled it, nothing. Didn't know it was there until we were tracking ourselves back out. Yeah. And we tried to mimic the indentation it made in the ground. And I was standing on one foot, he was standing on one foot, I'm standing on his foot. You know, we couldn't make the indentation. That it, was, was, it was that heavy, you know? Yeah, it was that heavy. And it wasn't, we couldn't do a cast because it was like filling up river's edge. So we kind of do tests like that, like trying to mimic, because you know, you, if it's not a large track, people don't think it's a big foot. Like that one, you know, we've been told that's not a big foot track. Well, yeah, it is, because my foot didn't make that deep of an impression in the mud. You know, his didn't make that deep of an impression in the mud. Yeah. So, yeah, that is. Another thing when you track, whether you're track, I used to track for the prison department too, by the way. But the thing is, I mean, like, like another thing that you look for, you, you know, tracks will tell you a lot of things. Tracking is not just tracks, okay? Uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, a Bigfoot's got to have a high five, six, seven foot gate all the time, and that's, that's not true. A Bigfoot will, sometimes he'll slow down, okay? Sometimes he'll stop. Sometimes he's injured, okay? Sometimes he's dragging something. Maybe he made a kill or something. See what I'm saying? There's all kinds of things that a, a track line will tell you about whatever. It's just, it's just like if you're tracking a human being, okay? There's all kinds of things that track line will tell you a story, not just the direction. But just, you know, some type of adaptation it made to its surroundings. I don't know. But another island where they say it was was Pickney Island. Um, there's a bunch of little sea islands in the southern end of South Carolina. So if you ever want to explore, that would be the place to go. Hunting Island, which is a state park, and Pickney Island, which is near Hill. So if you I'd like to know if you find them if you ever go. <laughs> I just wanted to mention, I've always been really fascinated with gorillas. I think that's why I'm so fascinated 
with this Bigfoot? Is it a part of a primate family or what? But I mentioned at uh, one of the conferences I've been to, either to Cliff or Matt from Finding Bigfoot, that I think it'd be so awesome. So many podcasters have so many wonderful call comments where they have actually reported the sounds and the cries and the screams. I think it'd be so awesome if somebody, researchers, would go to a zoo, to a primate in, you know, habitat, and play some of those sounds and see if there's any reaction from that. And yes, and that's why I'm determined to get more vocalization than I've gotten. And this is kind of a weird story, but the other night, to kind of, I didn't use vocalizations, but what I used was a song from the 70s from a group called Pink Floyd, and it's called Several Species of Small Furry Animals Gathered Together in a Cage Group with a Pig. <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> and it's uh, several sounds of animals that they use to create this song. And dogs, different animals, and whatnot to create, it's not even really a song, it's just a bunch of noise. And at the end, it's a very old dialect of Welsh speaking at the end of it. Now, years and years ago, I owned a business next, next to a pet shop. And the pets were so loud, the birds and everything was just so loud in the store. So I brought in a CD, and I told me I was friends with the owner. I said, put it on track six. And so he played that. And all the animals, he said, shut up and move to the back of their cages. Oh. And were scared to death. <laughs> So I tried to elicit a response, and we did get vocalizations after that, but I kept trying to get record, and I was just too slow. But yeah, so we use alternative means. We don't howl, we don't knock. I use Pink Floyd. Oh, yeah, you know, often you try. <laughs> you know? <laughs> she said she'll say something, I'll say, hey, try it. <laughs> you know, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I just uh, uh, I don't know. That, that's basically that, that's basically what we do. You know, we we go out there and uh, uh, like say like it's a promising area. And like what we what what I do is is uh, we know what type of location we're looking for, what type of habitat they like. Now we we'll, may go somewhere and not find anything, and that happens. You know, you're not going to find. It's like you're fishing, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, like one one thing I've learned, you know, being an angler is that, you know, 90% of the fish are 10% of the water, okay? That's just the way it is. You know, if you, you're looking for fish to catch, you gotta be where they're at. You can't wish them there, okay? Same with a big buck or whatever you're hunting or whatever, you can't wish them there. They just ain't gonna show up there because you want them to be there, okay? Same thing with Bigfoot. Bigfoot could show up anywhere. Dog man could show up anywhere, okay? This person might get lucky fishing the same place on a river for years. And you know, I, I know we've all run into somebody. I, a couple, there's a couple of guys on the Ohio River, and I'll, I'll ask them, I said, what do you fish here? I'll say, well, you know, 30 years ago, I caught a 40-pound you know, flathead here. You know, 30 years ago. You know, why not go where they're at all the time? You know what I'm saying? But, you know, uh, so what I do is what we do is that uh, we know the type of location that the Bigfoot, dog man, little people, what have you, would like. Now, whether they're there or not, we don't know until we investigate. But we use topo maps. We use history. We love history, don't we? We go back into history. You know, Native American settlers, uh, newspaper accounts, whatever, you know. And then we'll go into an area. More times than not, we won't find anything. Sometimes we do. And that's basically what, how, how, how we do our research, you know. One thing that I have found out is, uh, especially with areas that are known for, say, like the dog man special. Okay, I have never, ever, Okay, found a dog man that is, that has been, you know, pushed 
my publicity and commercialism. Every time I've gone into an area like that, I've been just absolutely disappointed. A lot of times, a lot of times it happens with Bigfoot too. Okay, but dog man especially. You know, I've never ever found any evidence of dog man in the in, in some of these much publicized heralded you know, man eating dog man locations that you hear about so much about, you know. So I mean it's just uh, uh our experience with the dog man is that they're shy. They're very shy. Like little puppies. I mean I feel sorry for them almost, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Hey Don, have you ever found a, a killing zones where yeah. you'll find like Oh, maybe five, six, seven skulls and piles of ribs and things like this. I mean, I, I found like the rocks and stuff along by trees, and I found the stack rocks. And, right. And, and, you know, I'll, I'll be able to print that, but I've not found those particular killing areas. Here in Michigan, there's an area where they found like two bear skulls. I mean, it's pretty rare to find skulls and stuff with bones anyway up with, but, but they were with, with, within a couple hundred feet of each other in this area, so we don't know if it's like a a big mob line taking up the result of Sasquatch right in that area. So we don't know if the Sasquatch has killed those bear, they killed each other, but, you know. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah. Kill, kill zones are incredible, and they're kind of scary when you find them. Yeah. They're in funnel areas, they'll funnel the game, okay? And if you look, what they'll, you know, there's always prevailing weather, you know what I'm saying? 90% of the time, maybe the weather coming from the east, might come in from the south, depends on what geographical area you're in. Okay, not all the time, but 90% of the time. You know, front will come in, you know. 90% of the time, the Bigfoot or the dog man, okay, is on the downwind side of the funnel area that kills off. Every time. I've never found that to be wrong, ever, okay? And that's what I always look for. If I'm, say like for instance, if I'm in an area where there's most, most of the weather comes in from the east, northeast, and I find a funnel area, okay? Then what I'll do is I'll look on the downwind side, okay? There'll usually be a blind of some kind set up and what they'll also do is they'll have rocks piled up. Oh, they'll have rocks piled up to use to throw. That's what we think they're for. Yeah. Because there'll be a pile of rocks. What else would they use it for? Yeah. Maybe to stun the prey or... Or yeah. kill the prey, stun the prey. Yeah. Yeah. Always found that, so... Yeah. There's always something that you can learn what have you. And we learn it on our own, basically. Because like I said, most of the things that I see. And, you know, as, it, as we've expressed, we kind of let the evidence speak for itself. Because if there's not evidence in the area, you know, it's not a Bigfoot area. Yeah. But, Can't wish other, <laughs> but other evidence, like we'll be researching Bigfoot. We'll get, this is our goal. You know, we've had goals each year to accomplish certain things, and we've accomplished them. But in trying to match those goals, we have found other things, like the little people. You know, why are we seeing these little tracks? And <laughs> we weren't looking for them. And you know, I followed little tracks, and they disappeared into nothing. And I don't know if they backtracked on me or what. Um, but but the other thing about Bigfoot tracks, and we test this out, and we've done it in a couple of our videos is we went to this place we'd never been to before. And we found a really nice bow tree um, and a, you know, a couple of other things that were twisted bow tree. On our way back out, that's when we found the Bigfoot track. It had followed us in and was behind us. We never saw it, smelled it, nothing. Didn't know it was there until we were tracking ourselves back out. Yeah. And we tried to mimic the indentation it made in the ground. And I was standing on one foot, he was standing on one foot, I'm standing on his foot. You know, we couldn't make the indentation. That it, was, was, it was that heavy, yeah. Yeah, it was that heavy. And it wasn't, we 
couldn't do a cast because it was like filling up with water, you know, because we were on the river's edge. So we kind of do tests like that, like trying to mimic, because you know, you, if it's not a large track, people don't think it's a big foot. Like that one, you know, we've been told that's not a big foot track. Well, yeah, it is, because my foot didn't make that deep of an impression in the mud. You know, his didn't make that deep of an impression in the mud. Yeah. So yeah, that is. Another thing when you track, whether you're track, I used to track for the prison department too, by the way. But the thing is, I'm like, like another thing that you look for, you, you know, tracks will tell you a lot of things. Tracking is not just tracks, okay? Uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, a Bigfoot's got to have a five, five, six, seven foot gait all the time, and that's, that's not true. A Bigfoot will, sometimes he'll slow down, okay? Sometimes he'll stop. Sometimes he's injured. Okay, sometimes he's dragging something. Maybe he made a kill or something. See what I'm saying? There's all kinds of things that a, a track line will tell you about. Whatever, just it's just like if you're tracking a human being. Okay, there's all kinds of things that track line will tell you a story, not just the direction. Uh, I don't know. We don't know. No, the, the only my son mentioned to me the only he goes there was a moment he goes where you had it. I had a sharp headache and I felt nauseous. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, we, we need to go. And that's when we came out and I see I start shaking. And Don was not at the vehicle. And I called his phone and I hit the alarm in the car. So we don't separate anymore. Yeah. If you ever do researches with us, we go together, we don't separate. Because I'm not, I'm not gonna lose anybody. Yeah, make sure she knows within sight. You know, neither one of us go anywhere. And there's actually, after it directly happened, there's actually a vis uh, video on our Facebook page of it, because I was so shaken up. And you could see us all looking back at the building like it's some creature that's going to come after us. Well, <laughs> we mean, were just stymied by the whole thing. And I, I, I took a break for a while from research. She did. She got kind of freaked out. I got kind of freaked out when I realized that they weren't, when I, when I realized that they weren't, that they wasn't cutting up with me. <laughs> See what I'm saying? It was like, wait a minute now, you know, because this is, you know, this is just too bizarre here, you know, because I had moved. I was up there. I was looking at the ground, just right. And he was nowhere to be found. And I'm thinking he fell off the cliff, <laughs> you know, because he can barely move. He had to go to the bathroom or something. He walked over to the edge. He went down. I, I mean, all these terrible thoughts were running through my head. It was a scary, I don't know, like 15 minutes. Yeah, it was a while. He lost some time. I was worried about that because I thought, well, they told me they'd be right out, you know, and they and, and they already come. And next thing you know, a few minutes later, right, yeah, about that long, they come around. The, but they said they come out the same door that they went into. So, <laughs> part two to this story, and I don't know if we ever talked about it. Um, the next day, my son wanted to conquer his fear. He was 17, you know. He wanted to go back. Now, written all over this building was one word in graffiti, and it was alone. A-L-O-N-E. Written quite a few times around this building. So, he wanted to go back in. And what we did is we drove around to the side of this building. I was really reluctant, but I didn't want him to go in by himself, and he was going to go in by himself whether I went or not. So. We went and we brought a few more things with us in case we did go somewhere else, end up somewhere else. And we went in through the bottom of the building. And I actually have a picture where you could see a set of eyes looking at us from inside the from building. From inside the building. From inside the building. As clear as a bell. What color were they? It was white. White. Yeah. Yeah. And it's in the darkness looking at us from in the darkness. And he, my son grabbed me and pulled me out of the building. And I said, what happened? He goes, there was somebody behind us. So I don't know that we ever talked about that or posted about that, but um, that was it for me. I said, there's so much. We've had some weird things. I, I was done. Yeah. You know, I really commend you for what you do because I believe in them and all these other crippled things. I, I don't have a problem at all with believing them, but I don't ever want to see one. Really, I truly would not. That's not my very most favorite desire in the world. 
I do not want to see one because like when you listen to podcasts and you see people, you listen to their stories, so many times it just changes their perspective of life. Like, oh. well, just it. <laughs> and, I, and I know I would be one of those people. I would be heartbroken that I didn't have that same joy, you know, that I lost because of what I experienced. You know, you know what I tell people is that you know, we're born into the world and we live our lives and we leave this world and don't even know, we know very little about the world. You know, I mean, that's like, it's like me, like I fished and hunted all my life and I was a award winner. I was in newspapers, I was in Outdoor Life magazine. I was, you know, uh, different magazines, uh, Career Journal, uh, little paper I was featured in, all kinds of, you know, for fishing and things like that. And and outdoors and you know you think you pretty much you, you, you got a grasp of everything out here because this is what you do you like doing this i've been doing you know i bought my first vehicle i bought bought my first uh truck uh i was i was traveling with my my grandpa in ohio county in uh, kentucky and i uh, sold my pelts you know, I saved up my pelts for a couple of years and I bought my first vehicle that way. I was just raised that way, okay? And then, you know, you go through your life and you think every, you know, this is, you got deer, you got bear, you got whatever, you got elk, you know, you got, you know, be safe. And then you realize, my God, you know, there's a whole other world out there that you know, that you knew nothing about that you was probably walking right. You know, the area where I seen the Bigfoot, Okay, first time I seen it, okay? Me and my son and my grandson would take a hike every once in a while, and we would see these strange structures, you know? And they'd say, hey, Dad, hey, Pat Baller, you know, what are these? <laughs> Hell, I didn't know, <laughs> you know? And uh, things like that, but later on I found out, see? So, you know, one of the strangest pictures I ever found out that I ever saw was this farmer in North Carolina, uh, I wanted to show me a picture of a Thunderbird. Okay. So I'm like, oh, okay. I was in North Carolina anyway. And I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll run by and, you know, check it out. Got a picture of a, this eagle looking bird that is absolutely humongous, circling four horses out, you know, from his porch. I mean, this bird was just incredible. I think, my God, they do exist. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, you just, you don't know, know until, you know, and I, I, and I said, well, what, what did you do when you seen this bird? And he said, well, I went and took my shotgun and I shot it, you know, set, set several rounds and scared it off, what have you. Know. But I've been doing some research on them. It seems like they, they move up and down the Appalachian Mountain Range. You know, but uh, yeah, it's one of the most incredible pictures that I've ever seen of anything like that. It makes me really doubt, I'm curious about if our history that we've been taught is really correct or not. Because look how much they keep from us. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't, I, well, I could spend days on that. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and, and, you know, and really, TV well, and I stuff, mean, you know. It, it's interesting that um, when my son was taking one of his last high school. Okay, they had just found an island, Flor Florentine Island, something like that. It's um, in the Pacific. And they found where they actually found the remains of small humanoid people, hobbits. And they're like, hobbits do exist. They found them when they were adults who were small in stature. And that ended up in his science book. And I'm like, see, your brother's not crazy. Well, you know, <laughs> These, these things have been everywhere. You got elves in Europe, leprechauns, you got, you got fairies in Iceland, okay, where they build roads around these rocks, where, the, you know, because they still believe in them. You know, there, yeah, there are areas out there. Scotland or somewhere? Who, where? All, all over the Is that Ireland right. where they build around Iceland. the rock? Uh, Iceland. Iceland? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I thought I heard that. But, uh, you know, there's just, there's just a whole world of, of these incredible beings and creatures, you know, 
But what would be the reason for them to keep it from us? I mean, they think we're going to go out and destroy them all, or what? Well, you know, they, they got their own set of history, you know, about how this their was. Their own agenda. Yeah, you, know, you know, their own timeline in history books, their own this, that, and the other thing. This is how they built this. This is how they built that. This is, you know, you know. That. Where did we get our fairy tales from? Right. Exactly. That's how I was talking to someone about the cobbler right. making the shoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting because if you look at history, and they used to have these world fairs. Have you ever heard about the Great Reset? The what? Yes. Okay. The what? The Great, the great Reset, where they reset history. So it's something to investigate. I don't know too much about it, but I can see, I hear things. Is that what they're doing now? I, we think so. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, every so often they got to reset history because everything gets out of whack. People start realizing, hey man, everything you've been telling us thus far is most of it's wrong. Okay, okay, well we got to reset things then. Okay. I'm just <laughs> so, like, I grew up with the legend of Paul Bunyan, you know? blue ox and his giant blue ox and you know and then you find out that there used to be a species of ox that was so large it's called an aurac it's actually mentioned in the bible too it's an extremely large uh, like water buffalo type animal extremely almost the size of an elephant so what about paul Bunyan? well now they're finding all these giant skeletal remains here and there and okay well, of course now we're thinking now we're researching, uh-oh, we can't have that. Yeah. You know, it doesn't fit our agenda for people to be thinking for themselves anymore. So. They don't want you to think. They want you to believe. They want you to believe their doctrine of how things are and how you're supposed to believe. So I was talking to Celeste and I were talking earlier about how 30, 40 years ago you couldn't even mention the word alien, but now on Fox News they're featuring off all of this. Yeah. And they have a con what are some kind of conference yeah, they had judicial governmental right to a vote Senate so, Congress so, meetings. But that makes me very clear. Well and that's the point I was just <laughs> gonna make. Government. That's the point I was just gonna make is that's why we don't participate in a lot of Bigfoot conventions and whatnot, because they wanna tell you what to think. They wanna tell you what this is. Instead of do your own research, we're all about yeah. go, go, like a, go out and do your research. You know, if you're interested in a cryptid and you hear of a cryptid, go do it. But you don't have to be, you know, a doctorate in this, that, or the other thing to research something. You just have to have your eyes open, your mind open, and pay attention to your surroundings. We don't ask people to believe what we found. Or no, we just tell teacher. you. We tell you, you know what I'm saying? So you think the ones that the anthropologists and all these. You they're, know, they're, they're, called, they're hurting you. They are being told, way. but they can and can't say they, anything. They yes. want you to believe yes. really? in, in yes. a certain, uh, in they, a certain doctrine. We call it drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah. Uh -huh. And yeah. if you stray, that's why we don't get the DNA anymore. Yeah. We don't. I don't fool with that because they want they want a certain outcome. Okay, that's what they want. And, and we won't do the type of TV or, or we've had producers approach us before, but we won't do it because I'm not going to have someone edit what I'm saying yeah. to fit their agenda. Yes. We actually, we actually had this one that uh, I don't need to know, folks. That's the way I, you know what I'm saying? I, 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 I get okay in life. But the thing is, is this, okay? Uh, come up to us and ask us, oh, you know, we want to do, and, you know, uh, you know, a new Bigfoot show, you know, and this is, this is going to be the plot. Same thing. They want to tell you what you Same, saying. different cast of characters, same thing. I think they want to do that to shut us up. And I told them, I said, look, I said, I'm sure there's a million people out there that would take you up on your offer. It's thousands of dollars an episode. Yeah, that, that expedition Bigfoot is a lot, kind of well, like now, a tape off of right, the Right, it wasn't too long about a year after uh, we were approached, that show went out. So whether that had anything to do with it, I have no idea. But the thing is, you know, I'm not a game player, okay? I want to know where, what they are, where they came from, and why they're here, okay? 
That's why, that's why I'm doing this. You know, I, it took away from my fishing career, okay? I mean, I, I, I spend more time in the woods with her, my beautiful assistant. <laughs> and uh, Such a sweet talker. Than uh, I do anything else, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, if anything, it's, it's hurt me financially. So, okay. I wanted to ask you, Don, why do you think all these crooked uh, programs are coming out? We've got find, we had Finding Bigfoot, <laughs> uh, These Woods Are Haunted, uh, Expedition Bigfoot. Why I, are these all coming out now? My, I'm like this. You want to learn how not to Bigfoot? Watch, the Watch one of the shows. They'll show you how not to Bigfoot. Okay? It's misdirection. That's right. Yeah. Misinformation. One thing. I have why are they creating all this awareness? I have, programs? I have a lot of government because contracts. Because there's more sightings. In, in fact, I need to ask y'all who are local. I want to ask you a question. Because this is something I heard. That in Detroit, we have a lot of abandoned homes. Whether it's correct or not. It's but true. I have heard that the Bigfoot have opportunistically started using these abandoned homes for shelter. I didn't know that. Okay. But see, that stuff like that that they don't want you to know, that they're coming into the inner cities. You've heard that? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Southfield is a, a place, you know, that I've, I've listened to a lot of stories about Southfield and, and different conventions we've been to. There's a guy that lives down there that trains through all those parks right there in the city. Yeah. I mean, but I, they will never find a Bigfoot on any of those TV shows because they will never be allowed to find a Bigfoot. Exactly. Even if there was one right there in the frame, you know, right here, they would cut it off because, I don't know, y'all probably listen to all these podcasts and all these stories, and okay, there are people out there that would say, well, people can say whatever they want. But I've listened to way too many where people have seen or hit with a car or had an experience or farmers have killed them. They are visited by people and they are threatened with yeah. losing their pensions, yep. their um, jobs. having their family murdered, mm -hmm. yeah. being, you will disappear, is mm -hmm. one of the phone calls that somebody got. They, it, they get the government's guy and you know the government's guy. They constantly hack our hack his computer. I've not had my my our websites hacked, brought down so many times. You have no idea. Oh wow! And I believe you need to be very careful. Well, I, 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 I'm like this too, you know. Having a career that I had, you know, with the various government con you know contractors, okay, I know what this information is. Okay, I know what misdirection is because I I worked for the other side. You know what I'm saying? So when I see stuff on TV, when I read stuff about Bigfoot stuff, I know that it's crap, for lack of a better word. Okay. Now you take the show like like the Find Bigfoot. You know, all right, they get on there and they have a town hall meeting. Of course, everybody seen a Bigfoot. They seen him crossing the street. In front of City Hall, they seen him in the backyard. They seen, but by the time the, you know, the fighting Bigfoot crew, these Bigfoot experts, you can't even find a deer anymore. You know, and they use the drones, they use the infrared, they use the, everything you can think of. We would never get to know well, look, listen, they're yelling and screaming. Yeah. How, come on, it's like I tell people: if you ever heard a Bigfoot howl. You know that you and your buddies don't sound anything like <laughs> one, okay? I mean, sometimes I think these people have never heard of Bigfoot Howl, you know? One time years ago, uh, in the, on the border of uh, Virginia and Kentucky, me and some of my Don P. Willis team was up on this, about three quarters up on this mountain, okay? And there was, we just by chance, we wasn't looking for these people, but there was a group of Bigfoot researchers below us. So we decided we was going to play one heck of a joke on it. Was, it was bad. So they were, they started howling and hitting trees and stuff. Next thing you know, you know, a buddy of mine said, hey, Tom, let's hit a tree. So next thing you know, we're hitting, we're, we're, we're hitting back. So, they, so they're hitting trees. We're hitting trees. 
the more we do it, the more they howl and scream and everything else, you know. And I, I told them, I told my buddies, I said, now they're going to go back and say that, man, they had one heck of a Bigfoot contact up there. <laughs> it was a bad thing to do. But we just couldn't help ourselves. We were kind of, we felt kind of mischievous. But uh, I don't know, you just, uh, you know, you just got to wonder about these things. So we were talking about the Thunderbird, and one of my theories is that could it be a subspecies or the same species as a prehistoric bird called the Argentavis because it was basically the same size as a Thunderbird? Right. I don't know. It could be. Or it could be some eagle that we never even dreamed existed. You know, that, uh, and we got some big eagles in the world, but this eagle, or whatever it was, was a whole lot bigger than anyone I've ever seen on television or anywhere else. And know. it could be what you mentioned, never did go extinct. Yeah, never could go extinct, yeah. You know, there's things out there, that, you know, that's still out there, man, you know. And, and I have another question for y'all, and I want to think, you to think about this, and I would love for you to get back to this on our site or whatnot. Tell us what you think. But somebody recently sent me a video of something that looks like a mermaid. So, mermaid, so I'd love to know what you all think about that. Or if you've ever been in the water and you've seen it. I've not been in the ocean enough, and I won't. Just sharks. I'm not a water. I don't go where something can yeah. kill me besides Bigfoot. But. <laughs> Let me say one more thing before we wrap it up. And my, uncle, my uncle Bill was in World War II with on the USS Alabama and all that. Okay, and he met this guy down in South Florida. They, he, they decided they, he was going to be a charter boat guy, and he was a charter boat guy for decades. And my cousin was a charter boat guy. And I worked there as a kid, deck hand. But anyway, we got out there in the ocean, and I, I said, hey, I said, to Uncle Bill, I said, Where, where's the Bermuda Triangle at? He said, Well, you're fishing it. Oh, and I said, Well, I said, uh, I kind of had a worried look on, this, on my face. He said, don't worry, man, my compass hasn't gone crazy. I haven't seen any flying saucers, none of But you know what? He told me that there were mermaids. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yeah, he told me he'd seen mermaids. And I believe him because he was a no-nonsense kind of guy. You want us to wrap it up? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Blake.